tonight I bring you away a man that I call a prophet. Without taking much more time, the father of the African revival, the apostle to the nations, shall we welcome Apostle Arome Osai. of man the preoccupation of man is to do and to serve the will of God and it happens to be that God is not a mortal part of what you'll be confronted with when you begin to do business with God is that he will rebuke you for adopting human ways not sinful ways human as we journey in scriptures you will understand what i'm talking about because eventually what god wants to achieve is to um, configure you to sustain the image of christ because when god in christ sought expression he found 100 percent expression in christ jesus there was an orientation there was a mindset there was there was a culture that he sustained uh, such that he was able to manifest God to the fullest extent. And every human being has that potential. But in order for you to manifest God to the fullest extent, you are going to have to understand that the ways of God are different from the ways of man. Lord, tonight we ask that you open the scriptures to us. We reach to find the secret of our ancient heritage so that we can line up with the prescriptions that you have given unto us in your counsel. Cause our hearts to be enlarged to capture the weight of matters that you'll be bringing our way tonight. Uh, grant, O oh God, that the seeds, the viable seeds that will come upon our heart will bear fruit. And let your name be glorified in Jesus' mighty name. Yeah. Amen. Please, you may be seated. God bless you. <laughs> so those of us that happen to have come for this conference from outside of Ghana, please, we want to recognize you. Uh, I want to invite you to take, just rise up on your feet so that we can acknowledge you. Before we fasten our seat belts, we can greet one another. Because when we take the flight, you will not remember who is sitting close to you. <laughs> yes, so you came from out of Ghana for this conference. We want to acknowledge you. Please make them make them super welcome. <laughs> In the name of Jesus. Please, you are welcome. Feel at home. This is the house of God. In Jesus' mighty name. Okay, turn your Bible to the book of Psalms. Psalms 50. We'll begin our presentation from verse number 5. Psalms 50, verse number 5. The falling church is fading away. And God will not change his mind on that matter. The real church is going to emerge out of the fallen one. In the fallen one, we have many gods. We have mammon. We have all kinds of uh, humanism. We have all kinds of projections that have obscured the reality of Christ. And many, uh, a, a huge priesthood has been built around this fallen church. In this priesthood, we have so many functionaries and uh, a large, wide spectrum of the bishopric supporting this priesthood that is falling. And Jesus, by his spirit, is beginning to quicken the church in Africa afresh 
because it's the African church that has the potential to fill the gap of missionary manpower and to tip the scales to provide an adequate window for God to break out on humanity one more time. So he is very critical about the state of the African church. So new voices will begin to emerge, new spokesmen that carry the frequency of the spirit of Christ. And it's going to be very contrary to the things that we have been used to in the past 15, 20 years. When error is institutionalized, truth will look like rebellion. That's my parable to you before we read the Bible. It said, gather my saints together unto me. When you hear the first invitation, you will think that God is asking all the believers to gather to him. And he knew that we were likely going to misunderstand the call. And that's why he had to clarify the quality of saints that he was referring to that should be gathered before him. He said, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. So invariably he's saying that it's not every believer that I need gathered. I only need those that have bound themselves with an oath to perpetually offer me sacrifice. And the reason why this category of functionaries are relevant and strategic in kingdom agenda, I will show you in a moment. Now, so come with me step by step. We want to build the foundation because the subject of altars is a very deep subject. And I don't know how far we are going to travel. So let me build the body of truth um, before we begin to take the journey. Come with me to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2. 1 Peter, chapter 2. 1 Peter, chapter 2, beginning from verse number 5. It says, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Now, the, the, the Bible is making us to understand that um, There is a New Testament type of priesthood. And the New Testament type of priesthood is dedicated to one agenda and one agenda only. To offer up spiritual sacrifices. As you come to realize as we study the Bible for a moment, you will find out that spirit understand the language of sacrifice. If you want to do business with spirit beings, you will need to begin to use the dialect of sacrifice. And so we see a scenario here because the Bible is talking about the priesthood of the New Testament, the Melchizedek priesthood. They say we are all lively stones and guess who is bringing this revelation of us as lively stones? It's Peter. Because when Peter got the revelation of Jesus Christ, he qualified to get a revelation of himself. So Jesus, on the account of the declaration of Peter, revealed who Peter was in the scheme of things of God's agenda. He called him a stone. Meanwhile, his father gave him Simon. Simon is a weed that is situated by the seashore that is tossed to and fro by the waves of the sea. That is someone without a conviction. Someone without a true position. Someone that can change positions every 30 minutes to suit the circumstance, to suit the situation. <laughs> and we are preachers like that. 
preachers that commercialize, so they want to be in the good books of every camp. They have friends among diabolical pastors, they are friends among liberal pastors, they are friends among conservative, convicted pastors. So they just flow like that so that their clientele level can be very broad. They can have invitations in the night on Sunday, they can have invitations in the afternoon on Wednesday because the scope of their market is wide. Such a man is not in the service of God. Because as you travel with God, you will discover that God is different. Please help me preach to your neighbor. God is different. And I know because of the mundane use of the word different, you don't understand meaning, the meaning of different within the context of the usage. When we say God is different, and your relationship with God is going to confirm, is going to express the fact that God is different. When we say God is different, it means that you cannot put God in a common class. You cannot say God and Satan, God versus Satan. God is not the opposite of Satan. You will notice that Satan happens to be a demonic, an angelic, a demonic angelic entity. When Satan was to be expelled from heaven, he took the effort of a divine angelic entity. That's the opposite of Satan. God is in his own class. You cannot put God in any context that is common. If you want to talk about God, you need to create his own pathway, his own context, his own platform. So God is different. And when you begin to relate with God, <laughs> he will purge you from everything that is common so that you can embrace his significant difference. And that difference is going to be reflected in your life so much so that your generation will, will evolve a name for your type. Because God is eventually going to make you different if you are going to relate with a God that is different. So if you see the scripture, if you see the scripture that we just read, it speaks about a holy priesthood. Not a common priesthood, a, a, a priesthood that is separated to a God that is different. It has its own dimensions. The fact that you were a priest to a deity in the northern region and you gave your life to Christ doesn't make you equipped to follow God because by the time you come to walk with God, you will find he is what? Oh, you are not following me. Now, because you did not respond, I, there's an aspect of the syllabus I'm going to cut off. That's the way I, I, I protest anytime I notice people are not following. It took me how many days in the cave to come out with what I want to share with you. So if you are not ready for it, I'll be cutting it away. I, I will, before, maybe before the end of next year, I'll find a congregation that is worthy of, of, of my syllabus. So he calls it a holy priesthood. So it's not the type of priesthood you know. Maybe you know the way the cast spells, you know the way witches operate, you know uh, some of the um, vocabulary in incantation. You will find that this is different. Your education in the kingdom of darkness does not equip you in any way to function in the kingdom of light because it is what? Different. It's different. If you leave a chemistry class and you go to a physics class, there is no way to compare the two because they are different. So God is different. It, he, he's in his own class. is exclusive. And the priesthood that is built in his name carries elements of the exclusivities that is, con, is, is descriptive of his difference. So we are going to see, uh, talk more about that priesthood. So the Bible says, we are all lively stones and we are, we are built up into a spiritual house. So when Jesus was asking them who they said he was in the city of Caesarea Philippi, the reason why he was asking the question was because he was pregnant with the revelation of the church. But in order for him to be triggered, to communicate the revelation of the church that he was pregnant with, 
he needed to know if anyone had designed him for who he was. And that was why Peter said, thou art the Christ, thou art the son of the living God. And that was a trigger that was needed for Jesus to begin to communicate about his building plans. And he, he said that in Caesarea Philippi. Uh, it, uh, Philip the Tetrarch, Philip that became the governor of that region, happened to be a civil engineer. So when he was brought into power, he wanted to show the dexterity of his knowledge as an engineer by giving Caesarea a facelift. He transformed it and make, made it another city. So that new city he built out of the ruins of the old city was now named after him, Philippi. That's why Jesus had to come to that city before he spoke about the church. Because everything in the environment was speaking building. There were iron rods on the ground. There were paint buckets everywhere. There were blocks. There were stones. Cement bags were everywhere. So the environment gave credence to the things that Jesus wanted to communicate so that it would not be abstract. Are you with me? Okay. So Jesus also said, I'm also into building. And upon the rock of the revelation of Christ, the church is going to be built. And if the church happens to be built that way, the gate of Hades shall not prevail. And I don't have time to explain what the gate of Hades means. It shall not prevail. The only condition for the gate of Hades not to prevail is that the church is built, how? On the foundation of Christ. Because there are many other ways that the church can be built. But if it's built in those ways, it is not Jesus that is the builder. So you will notice there are two things, two things there. He said, I will build my church. So the church is his. There is a dimension of ownership to the church. And then he's a civil engineer that is in charge of the construction. So if he calls you and gives you an anointing so that you can join him in the building process, he will always come to inspect what if what you are doing is consistent with the master plan. Because buildings are not haphazard. Are you there? So when buildings, when building patterns are in digression from what the builder wants, what he does in the body of Christ is that he raises voices that have the accurate template. And then they'll begin to prophesy. And then it will be obvious that a lot of buildings and the, this pillar was not supposed to be. I hope you know there's going to be chaos. If you don't have the skin of a crocodile, you can't even play that kind of role. So Jesus in this era, in the next 12 to 14 years in the body of Christ, will be doing reconstruction. And there are a lot of blocks that will be broken out of the design. People built, but they were not looking at the master plan. They built flesh, even built altars to mammon, and it was in the same structure. Built all kinds of stuff. But you see, the real thing that he is building is a spiritual house. A house that has the capacity to capture the dimensions of heaven. Because God's original purpose has always been for heaven to be contained in the earth. Right? So if you find there are some scriptures, you will see the heaven-earth linkage. For instance, the Bible says, whatsoever you bind on earth, it shall be what? Bound in heaven. Whatsoever you lose on earth, it shall be what? That will be done on earth like. He wants to build a spiritual house that has the capacity to trap the dimensions of heaven. It's something in the likeness of that garden called Eden. Have you ever thought about that garden? Oh, you're not, you not still here. Have you thought about that garden? God, who happens to be a spiritual being, was coming into the earth, coming into that garden. 
That garden was an embassy. Do you know the um, diplomatic laws concerning embassies? For instance, the embassy of the United States in Accra, Ghana, is a part of the United States, even though it is in another country. It runs under the laws of the United States of America. If you break into that place and release gunfire in that place, it is an act of war because that territory is a part of the United States of America. Are you with me? That's how Eden was. Eden was an embassy. And that was, God was not coming into the earth as it were, he was coming into Eden. Eden was a part of heaven that was upon the face of the earth. And that was the dwelling place of the high commissioner called Adam. Oh, you are not with me? Adam was an ambassador, not of earth, and Adam was an ambassador of, of heaven to earth. And Adam was supposed to bring the government of heaven upon the face of the earth. His jurisdiction was within earthly territory, but his nationality was where? You are now following me. Part of his assignment was to make the entire earth like Eden. So that the entire earth becomes a colony of heaven. And God will not need visas to come to the earth. God can come into the earth in the cool of the day the way he came into Eden in the cool of the day. So the spiritual house that we are talking about has the capacity to trap the dimensions of heaven. When the, have you ever, okay, there is something called a shrine. You are, if you are African enough, you should know what the meaning of a shrine. A shrine is a place where a spiritual reality is trapped so that you go to a physical location and then you can encounter a spiritual reality. Are we still? Now, if that spiritual reality is trapped in that place, it means that the place is operating by the laws that governs the realm of that reality. That's why they, that place could trap. It's an embassy. That place is an embassy. So God wants to build a priesthood in the earth that can trap his dimensions on the ground. So that everyone who need to travel to heaven to touch the dimensions of God, they are, they, are, they are here. True priesthood. So you can come to UPSA and you touch something that is native of heaven. It's a crude, crude and indigenous reality that is obtainable in heaven. You touched it in a physical place. The only way that can happen is if we have a priesthood. And the objective of a priesthood is to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You see, the reason why all of these terminologies are clarified and adjectives are used to give us accurate descriptions is because it is not only the priesthood of Christ Jesus that exists. There are so many priesthoods. But, you see, it is only acceptable because it is offered to God through the valid pathway and the valid pathway of acceptance is through Jesus Christ. Do you, you understand that? Now, so this is an airtight arrangement so that no other spirit will receive gratification from our efforts because it is done through Jesus Christ as the approved pathway of acceptance before the Lord. So all of this scripture is revealing a New Testament structure of priesthood that is intended to trap the dimensions of God. So that the realities of God are, can be found, can be encountered in natural spheres, in physical locations. And like Jacob, we wake up from our slumber and say, the Lord was here. He said, and I did not know it, but the Lord is here and I know it. That's my own version of that expression. May the Lord give us understanding in the name of Jesus. So when the Bible says, gather unto me, my saints, and it goes further to qualify the kind of saints he's talking about, those that are 
made a covenant with me by sacrifice, then it means that God has a need. Let me show you the need of God quickly and the reason for priesthood, and then we can now go into the law of altars. God's need. Once upon a time in the book of Psalms 115, In Psalms 115, verse 16, we see what I call a royal decree. And when we say the royal, a royal decree, we are saying an utterance that God decreed with all of his integrity so that it can become a functional law. God does not rule by brute strength. He rules by his authority. The first time words were used in the Bible, it was not for communication but it was for creation. So creation evolved as a result of God exercising his authority. If you are still with me, say amen. amen. Now listen. Have you heard the story of our inclusion as told by Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians? Apostle Paul tells us our origin. And he doesn't tell us our origin from the natural perspective. Because he knows that most of us don't know our natural history. You don't even know the name of your great-grandfather. Do you, do you know the name of your great-grandfather? Okay, you don't. Okay, most of us don't. I'm seeing somebody, I, I, I think the person, the, the meaning of the, the way the person is doing his face. Maybe, maybe he knows his, his great-grandfather. But as, as important as your natural history is, it is not so important. It's, a little, it's of little importance anyway, but not so important. So Apostle Paul tells us our story from the immortal perspective. Let me, let me give you an idea of what I'm talking about. In the book of Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, just leave my scripture, Psalms 115 verse 16. Apostle Paul said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms through Christ Jesus. So the subject of Acts chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Sorry, there are too many scriptures in my head and I'm trying to dispense them in perfect order. Now, the subject of Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 is... Um, is the Bank of Ghana. That's the Bank of Ghana. That, that's, that's where the currency that drives the economy of Ghana comes from. Are you with me? Okay, so the Bible says that we should bless God who happens to be the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason why he's saying we should bless God is because God already blessed us first. And he blessed us with spiritual blessings that are domiciled in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Oh, you are lost. Let me, let me leave you. <laughs> that's a, that's, that's um, a credit line. That's a credit line. You want to do business, you need to get a credit line from the bank. And as long as you can commit, co confirm that there's a credit line supporting your initiative, then partners and all the stakeholders are willing to talk to you because you have a credit line. So God gives us a credit line and he says that this credit line, the, the value of this credit is in the heavenly realms. And unfortunately for us, the value of that credit is in the name of Jesus. That is in Jesus' bank account, not in yours, not in mine. I know somebody smart in the congregation, a businessman will answer, okay, if God is really uh, making value available to us, why does he put it in the name of another person? Why not in my name? And why will he put it in heaven? 
Why would he not put it in, in, in Kumasi, put it um, in, in Accra, put it in Tema? He did that once before. He put our account in the name of Adam. Okay, so you understand the, the story. <laughs> he, he tried that before. I guess what Adam did. Adam, instead of spending from it, didn't spend any Ghana CD from it, just handed the account over to the devil through rebellion. And guess what happens to somebody that has a credit line? He, 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 the possibility of establishing his vision upon the face of the earth exists. So Satan was adequately funded to begin to implement the policy he tried to establish in heaven that he was cast out from heaven. He now had the resources to implement it. Where? So now, are you there? I'm just still testing if you are following. I've not started this my journey. Just trying to... Some of, in fact, my, the question is, how did you even get here? I saw the hold up of my life today. <laughs> oh my God. You are welcome in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Secondly, the reason why the value of that credit line is hooked up in the heavenlies is because if we put it in Tema, a government can come and annex all those resources. And you will not have access to that which is yours. Those days when I knew Ghana, Ghana had 10 regions. Then I came back one time and I was talking about the 10 regions of Ghana. I found out I was already obsolete. It was now 16. It means some regions have been cut off. If your resources, okay, I think you understand what I'm talking about. Cut, they cut some to create others and a, the political architecture of the entire landscape shifted. It means that even your resources, people can claim it. If that kind of reconfiguration takes place and the thing is earth bound, <laughs> contentions and court cases will begin to emerge. So he puts it in the place of safety and he puts it in the name of... So all our processes in kingdom business must pass through that account. So do you understand that? The next verse, which is Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, now reveals the manifestation of the authority of God. And the reason why I'm explaining this is because of the scripture of interest, which is Psalms 119 verse 16. The Bible says, according as he has chosen us in him. The first sovereign activity that I'm talking about, your history, my history. The Bible says that God chose you in his son before the foundation of the world. Do you realize that God, God has concluded the matter? God is not time-based. God dwells in an intersection of reality. So by an act of God's authority, he chose you. But is it, there's a context in which he chose you. He chose you in Christ Jesus. So if you never get to come into Christ Jesus, you will never know that you are chosen because you cannot access the resources because that's where the bank account is. The credit line is linked to that context. You get that? So the moment you come into Christ Jesus, this is the guarantee. Your destiny, your essence, your purpose upon the face of the earth is fully funded thereafter. Am I speaking above your head? Now, so you might ask me a question. All right, if my destiny is fully funded, how come I'm in this state? That's why we are doing this lecture. I want to show you the missing link. I need to show you that link. So you see, God, by an act, exercised his authority in eternity past to choose you. Your destiny cannot be understood in time. Sorry. You will need to have a means by which you travel into the past, the eternal past, to, to scroll on the heart of God in order for you to know what God had written concerning you. It's not something you decide, it's something you discover. And if you are going to travel that far, there is only one technology that affords you the opportunity for that kind of trip. And that technology is captured in the theme of our conference this time, which is the science of altars. The science. It's, it's a science. 
It's a very complex subject and very intensive and vast. But I would take it step by step and then we'll see how far we can travel. At any point where our time is exhausted, we'll, we'll make camp there. And any other time God leads us this way, we'll pick it up from that point. So what we are seeing here, this scripture is the exercise of God's authority, just like God had to exercise his authority in order for you to be chosen in Christ Jesus. And now that you have come into Christ Jesus in time, because he chose you in Christ Jesus in eternity, he included you in Christ Jesus in eternity, that's where your destiny is, that's where your reality is. You can decide to stay outside of Christ Jesus, too bad for you. What, what you have outside of Christ is that you have been measured as an entity in time. You cannot strike a chord in eternity from whence that which was written concerning you was inscribed. So your life is like vapor because eternity doesn't recognize the authority of time. One of the things that will be taken away the moment we, you enter into eternity is time. So they don't recognize time from that framework you begin to strike a chord in that framework in time when you find out what was written concerning your eternity and you begin to leave it in time. Then it begins to show on the radar. So if you never come into Christ Jesus, you never know what is ordained and your life on earth doesn't have meaning. It, have, it may have, somebody might be calling you as part of a family. I'm number five. But those are the things of men, not the things of God. If you are still with me, say amen. amen. So this is a royal decree. It says the heaven. Even the heavens are the Lord's. But the earth has it given to the children of men. This scripture speaks about jurisdiction. Jurisdiction. Um, and it's a royal decree. And what I mean by that is that God exercised his authority to include this decree as law. When God speaks, he doesn't use words the way we do because of the authority that is vested in his words. He has decided that as he has exalted his word above all his name, so if God speaks, his words become law and he himself becomes subject to the things that he says. So he doesn't use words the way we do. When God speaks, he means what he says and he says what it means. So if God is saying that he has given men, the sons of men, the earth, that his own headquarters will be domiciled in the third heavens. That's what the Bible means by heaven of heavens. The heaven, even the heavens. Talking about the third heaven, they are the Lord's. That's his domain. That's where his administration is domiciled. And everything in that realm is consistent with his will. It is a realm where he can manifest his authority to the fullest extent. And now he says he has given unto us the earth, the sons of men will exercise their dominion upon the face of the earth. The moment this decree was made, it will amount to a breach of territorial in integrity if God comes into human space without human permission. Are you there? That's number one. Number one point. Number two point that I need to confront us with quickly is the fact that earth controls heaven. Earth controls heaven. I know you don't believe that. <laughs> so give me Matthew chapter 18, verse 18 to 20. Earth controls heaven. First thing I'd like you to notice is a royal decree that reveals the jurisdiction of humankind. We are the chieftains of the earth. The politics of the earth is given unto man. The entity that rules is the entity that man enthrones. Did you get that? Second thing I'd like you to notice is that earth controls heaven. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind, where? Seems you are afraid shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever ye shall lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Can you see? Earth will have to initiate the process. 
and then heaven will comply. Next verse, 19. And again I say unto you, these are disclosures. This, 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 what we are reading about in the book of Matthew chapter 18, verse 18 and 19 are disclosures from Jesus to show us possibilities that are obtainable when we begin to understand the linkages between the earth and heaven and how man can exercise his authority as the chieftain of the earth. He say, and again, I say unto you, that if two of you, the first one is a personal principle, the second one is a corporate principle. So in this second one, he say, two of you. So it, this is, I don't want to take you too far. Two of you, let's leave it there. Shall agree, where would they be on earth as touching anything that they shall ask? It shall be done by my Father, which is in heaven. Verse 20 is the technology that makes verse 18 and 19 a possibility. I don't want to go there. It's a technology. This technology contains four things. Are you following me? I'm trying to make it as simple as possible so that it will not be like algebra or like calculus. You will notice that the starting point is the earth. So an altar. So many definitions. But let me give you the simplest one. All the others rest on this one. An altar is an embassy. It's an embassy where Entrance into human territory is negotiated. Just like you want to go to the United States of America, you need to negotiate your entry into the nation at the embassy of the United States in Accra. You, for some people, you, you can be doing very well, and then when you enter into the, the embassy, you just start becoming sick. It's not because you are sick. <laughs> I know some of you have experienced that. Uh, and, and the staff of the embassy is a psychologist. The moment he sees you shaking like this. And meanwhile, you were okay from home. Earth contumbre and, and yam. And came into the embassy. You were overwhelmed by the glory of the United States of America. And you could not negotiate your entrance into the country adequately because you began to stammer and they felt you were lying, even though all your documents were accurate. You had everything that was required for you to make the trip, but you were not given the travel document because you could not convince the staff of the consulate that you are saying the truth. And you were sent back home. Your account was in good shape. Your documents were correct, but you could not negotiate your way. Now, that's how God becomes frustrated when we don't give him a visa to come into our space because an altar is an embassy. You are going to allow God permission to come function in your space. So prayer is earthly permission for heavenly interference. If you don't want any heavenly interference, forget about praying. And let me tell you something for free. If you don't go the way of prayer, you're already under the influence of another altar. And some of you are in this place, you are beautiful, you are intelligent, you have a good job, you have, you, but you have noticed in the past three years, no man wanting to marry notices you. The ones that notice you are married men. I know you will laugh, but I have seen it in the spirit. And that's part of the problem I came here to solve. Trusting the Holy Spirit to empower me. Are you still there? Oh, there are mysteries in human life. And all the mysteries of human life are derived from altars. So given the fact that earth will need to take the initiative, given the fact that by jurisdiction, this is our space and God will not 
violate our territorial integrity until we allow him access into our space. Then in order to give God perpetual access, we'll need to subscribe to a technology which is to raise an altar. The concept of altars, as I told um, a few people in Bible study yesterday, is not, a new, is not an Old Testament concept because they are not... <laughs> Uh, the, this altar matter is very vast. In fact, and I showed them a scripture from the book of Hebrews chapter 13, verse 10, how that Paul says, we have, we, we New Testament saints, we have an altar. Just to disabuse the idea that it's an obsolete Old Testament technology that should not be raised in New Testament parlance. I also came to confront you with the fact that seven times in the book of Revelation you are going to find the operation of altars. So altars are not only earthbound, we also have altars in heaven. I need to teach you how to operate altars on earth first. Then how to connect, before I show you how to connect your altar to the altar that is in heaven. If I, I need to teach you earth, then we'll go to heaven, i show you how the heavenly altars operate and in that capacity there's a priesthood that is in the heavenlies. That's part of Jesus' heavenly ministry. And he is a divine priest, he's a king priest. According to the scriptures, he's a divine priest. Which is connected to the fact that his priesthood is powered by his endless life. He's a heavenly priest because his altar is in heaven. And then he's a king priest because he functions from a standpoint of authority that is a consummate manifestation of the power of the altars that he presides over. And these things I just told you now are the things for which Apostle Paul had to pray for 17 years in order for him to gain the altars to be able to communicate in the book of Ephesians. Now, it will take us like four to seven days to talk about the altars of heaven, how they operate then you'll be able to understand fully when we say Jesus is the Christ. You know the meaning. And just in case you have a political leader that has a throne, he wields authority, there is no throne that is like the throne of the Christus. But we will need time to show you the expanse of authority that that throne manages. It manages every substance that is in the new creation. But I don't have time for that. If you are still with me, say amen. amen. So we'll start from the altars of earth. And before we begin this journey, I need to show you the layout of the temple of the Old Testament. Are you still with me? When you pass the outer court, you have gone beyond the lever that is outside. And then you walk into the holy place then all the realities of priesthood begin to show themselves to you. Firstly, you're going to see the brazen altar. Brazen is a key word. Anytime you see brazen in the Bible, it means judgment. And the brazen altar is talking about the cross of Jesus Christ. What powers the brazen altar is blood. And that's the biggest altar on earth, is the brazen altar, the cross of Jesus. Because that was the place where they sacrificed that did the politics that brought about the possibility of the atonement of humankind and uh, also to bring humankind into the family of God. The story of the gospel is that the son of God became the son of man so that sons of men might become sons of God. That reality was paid for by a legalistic platform which is the death of Jesus Christ. If you go to the book of Isaiah chapter 53, you are going to see the impact of his suffering, the impact of his death. The Bible says he was wounded for a transgression. That means his wounds were supposed to take care of our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Every suffering he went through created spiritual value in the realm of the spirit. So that cross was not just an emblem. It was an altar that created possibilities. The same scriptures that speak about redemption are the same scriptures that speak about deliverance. So if you have a right to be saved, then you have a right to be delivered. 
is the same payment. It has ripple effects. And that's the greatest altar that you can take advantage of when you see a generation floating under the influence of the spirit of wisdom. There is only one altar strong enough to turn the tide and to change the fortunes of a hardened criminal into a saint in the kingdom of light. Nothing just happens. If anything happens on earth, it means there was an altar that was set. I'm going to show you how vast altars are. And in your daily life, you are not just aware of it. Altars are situated everywhere in your office, in the markets, in your family. Because as you will come to realize, man was designed to live by altars. Man was created a priest. That's the idea behind the science of his design. Oh, you are not, you are not following me. Are you there? That's the idea behind the science of design, of his design. He was created spirit, soul, and body so that he can access the spirit realm legitimately and also function in the natural realm legitimately. Only man has this privilege. Not even God. Not even God. Angels have spiritual bodies, disqualifying them from operating in three-dimensional world. We are the only being that span from that side to this side. And the reason why we're created like this and wired like this is because the height of our possibility will be tied to our priesthood, our service around the altars. And I, 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 don't, I just don't have time to build and then to show you that there was no school where altars were taught. But from the book of Genesis, you will see during the infantile seasons, when the earth was in its cradle, humankind was still an infant. Altars began to operate from those days. Men are supposed to function by altars. So we have demonic altars, we have righteous altars. And the kind of altar that you are going to establish will shape your life. You cannot do altar business without being shaped. When there was confusion in the early church and there was a temptation to make the apostles administrators, they remembered the things they learned from Jesus. Their job description was defined during their capacity building sessions. They said, we will give ourselves what? Now, when we say you gave yourself, what does it mean? I, I know you, you understand it intellectually. But you see, when we separate somebody from the society, in the voter, I have forgotten the name of the altars in the, in the vote. Well, and we separate the person to an altar and say, today we dedicate you. Your life should be lived around this reality. That person's life will be shaped by his oppression in that place. If you meet him at the age of 60, when you meet him, he will not be talking chemistry. He will have a dialect. A dialect that has evolved from giving himself to that shrine. So when the apostle says we are going to give ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the world it means our life our days will be shaped entirely by prayer and the word of God it's not a light thing when we begin the protocol when we begin practicals you will discover that you have not shaped your life by prayer you will find out in the day of battle where destiny is at stake and the heritage of God is about to be lost in the land, God sends out a clarion call. Gather my sins unto me. He doesn't call you. You will not be called that day. 
them that have made a covenant with me. How? By sacrifice. Because those are the ones that can keep the gates open for me to ride in in my majesty. Those are the ones that can open the territories. They can create earthly permission for heavenly interference because of their commitment to perpetual sacrifices that will legitimize my manifestation. Just in case you have not been seeing God in your family, in your space, not so much of him in your office, there is nothing that can legitimize his invasion. If he comes there, you will not even know why he came. You, you say, you. Imagine one of the high chiefs of Ghana, the, some of the revered chiefs of Ghana, then, I mean, while you are staying in Bawe, early in the morning, you just see me. <laughs> Even you yourself will begin to ask, is there, is there a difference? <laughs> <laughs> you did not invite him. So, in fact, you will become afraid. God doesn't like that kind of emotional breakdown. You will need to do something deliberate to put him on the scene. He's, he doesn't violate protocol. He's such a man, such an entity of, of the divine order. He doesn't break the protocol. Just like the devil came and the devil began to talk with Eve and Adam was there. The person that God gave the instruction about how they should operate, the man was there, he left the man and started talking to his wife. Someone that received the discipleship. And you notice that when God came into the garden, who did he call? Adam! Because God will never violate protocol. Satan will never keep to protocol. So the, the priesthood of Satan is different. It's different. And you can be so faithful to Satan and then he will kill you after you have accomplished a, a great victory for him. He will just, he will just kill you and say, you... you you know too much. You know too much. Die. <laughs> so what Satan will give you as reward for, for meritorious service is death. So the people he's in love with desperately, he kills them. Because that's the only commodity he has to dispense. That's the merchandise that is in his bag. If you are still with me, say amen. amen. It's now I believe you are here. I would, I would have been talking like that until the time finishes. We need to create earthly permission for heavenly interference. So setting up the first law of the altar. First law of the altar is that the altar must have a covenanted human attendant. That's the first law. Given the fact that the earth controls the heavens, the earth determines the resources of the heavens that are deployed into it. The earth is responsible for creating and legitimizing the invasion of heaven. So we need a covenanted human attendant for every altar. Now, if God permits, I will show us, I want to start from a personal altar. If we have time, then we'll go to family. Then go to community. Each one has the rules and regulations of how to establish it. Are you still with me? Or you are not with me? I said, are you with me? Okay, so, you know I was telling you about the temple, the layout of the holy place, and I said there's a brazen altar and brass, which is the cross. And God decided to apply the judgment that was due for man on Jesus Christ because he was operating by the principle of substitution. So Jesus took our place in death so that we can take his place in life. All of that is captured in the sacrifices that form the brazen altar. The second apparatus you are going to find in the holy place is what we call the altar of incense. The brazen altar, just like I told you, the cross is the strongest altar that God has. That's the strongest 
legal platform that God has upon the face of the earth. It has the capacity to turn humanity around. Jesus did not die for Christians. He died for the whole world. And part of our assignment as Christians is to ensure that Jesus received maximum return on his investment. Are you there? The second apparatus you are going to find in the holy place is the altar of incense. And I don't have time to take you to the book of Revelation chapter 5, but I know you know the scripture. Where the Bible speaks about others in the vials, the golden vials. There were others that came out of it. And the incense and the others were the prayers of the saints. So that altar of incense is talking about your prayer adventure. If you want pastors to become full of fire, if you want the church of Jesus to have the capacity to influence and dominate the earth, then we must operate from the altar of incense. The third apparatus that you'll find there is the table of shewbread. But it is needful for you to understand that in this altar of incense, the priest, which is you and me, we are not perfect. So it is possible for you to miss. It's possible for you to miss the mark. It's possible for you to commit an infringement. So you, the minister, we need another altar. But this altar that you will need is not in the holy place. Are you there? This one is in heaven. You will need to link up with the altar of mercy so that you can be made a right and you can be made qualified to still operate at the altar of incense. Now, so we will be doing the interactions between the heaven and the earth. The ultimate prayer from the altar of incense. Are you there? Yeah. It's praying from earth to heaven. But prayer from the holiest of all is no longer pleading and begging. It is decree and commandment and judgment. If you are operating from the heavenlies, your prayers are like commandments, commands, decrees. If you are operating from the altar of incense, there's a lot of appeasement that is involved. And I'm going to show you the protocol and how to move. <clears throat> and then we'll do a practical session, maybe for 15 minutes. Then I will show you how to climb. Are you there? Now, so our focus for this conference is the altar of incense. So the first thing that... Do uh, you still remember the book of uh, Luke chapter 1? When Zechariah went to offer burnt offerings... The Bible says his lot was to offer incense after the order of his course, and his course was the order of Abiata. So it means that they cast lots and the thing fell on Abiata. Then they cast lots on all the priests. That you can be a priest and never minister once until you die because it's by lot. They believe God, the divine, will have to choose the one that will stand before the altar. You are a priest, though, but you never have burnt incense. So the thing fell on his cause and fell on his name. So he had the opportunity after many years. He was already an old man. Now the angel that was sent from heaven to meet with him was standing there, but the angel could not interact with him until he began to burn incense. Then the platform of interaction between the realms was created. Do you understand that? So that's an embassy. He was creating earthly permission. For what? For heavenly interference. I'm going to show you how angels operate. Oh my God. Oh my God, oh my God. See, the army of Israel, what we call the army of Israel, was not only populated by men. There was an angelic side to that army. That was what God was trying to show Joshua. And he took him, and he met with the captain of the angelic army. And he spoke like, like a prince, he spoke like a general. Are you for us or against us? He did not understand the Guru. The angel told him, I'm not for you. He said, nay. The meaning is, I'm not for you. I'm not against you. My marching orders come from the other side. As a captain of the army of the Lord, am I come? I don't receive instructions from you. And because Joshua was quick to claim he was a warrior, he had to be punished. 
They asked him to go and keep quiet, to close his mouth and march around the city seven times to atone for his lack of decorum. You are going, God wants to synchronize you with the angelic armies, but you need to know the way of priesthood and the rhythm of things. You need to give away most of the ways of men that you have been, you are, you are used to. If you don't know how difficult it is for you not to talk. Try it. Try. You want to go for a crusade, don't even pray. Just go and keep quiet for three days and don't talk. Only talk when you get to the crusade ground. You will find out you don't have the ability to do it. In priesthood, God will teach you things, uh, things that are not things of men. I'm, I'm still waiting for permission to talk to you, to tell you what I have seen in my small work with God. At some point, we'll pray for God to give me permission to talk. Are you there? So there must be a human, a covenanted human attendant. That means by covenant, this time and for this long, I'm going to stand before the Lord. And I will keep standing until he gives me an answer. How many of you have the courage for that kind of journey? Because most of you begin to press into God. And when, when you go for 21 days, because they, maybe somebody told you that that's the almighty formula of prayer. You pray for 21 days, then you get an answer. It, when you start to become deliberate about your interaction with God, that's when you will know that God is a king. That's when you will know that your tears will not make him respond. Even your prayer will not make him respond. You know why he will respond? Because he wants to respond. You can't influence his response. So if you don't know the protocol of waiting, you are even disqualified now. Don't start. You are going to receive the greatest attacks of your life the moment you begin to become committed to your altar. Satan knows that you have, you have embraced the principle that can destroy his fortress, his kingdom. He will do anything to distract you from that level of commitment. Guess what? Let me tell you something. Let me talk with scriptures because you will be confused if I talk plainly. Luke chapter 49. Luke chapter 24 verse 49. Okay, let's begin from verse... 46 from verse 46 and said unto them thus it is written and thus it behoved of Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning from Jerusalem ye are witnesses of these things. Are you there? Okay. Next verse is my verse of interest, 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father unto you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. This is what we call the notice of an appointment. When Jesus rose from the dead, there were 40 days in between the day he rose and from the day he ascended into heaven publicly. The interval was 40 days. In this interval of 40 days, Jesus did not have a physical address where you could come and visit him. The way he met with his apostles was by appointments. So he gives them appointments. Let us meet on this place, on this hill. I can show you seven instances within that bracket of time where Jesus gave various types of appointments. In fact, one of the times they were in the room, they locked themselves up because of the fear of the Jews. The doors being shut, the Bible says, and Jesus stood in the midst of them. The first thing he said was, Peace be unto you. I 
hope you know why he said peace. He was saying peace because they were hiding in that place because of the fear of the Jews. And there was no peace in their heart. They were afraid. Torment had taken them over. So the first statement was peace be unto you. After he had said peace be unto you, he moved to Thomas instantly. Because previously when he appeared, Thomas was not there. And Thomas said, if I don't see the nail print, if I don't see the piercing by the side, I will not believe. He said, As, after peace be unto you, he went to Thomas and asked him to do his, carry out his examination. Now, what he was trying to make them understand was, even though he was not physically present, he heard all of their discussion. He was trying to show them that he is now invincible. But the evidences he's bringing means he was still with them, even in his invisible state. Because a new regime in the Godhead was about to take place where Jesus was going to be invincible. He was not going to be visible again. So he was trying to nurse them into that era so that they could have faith that his presence was, was ever abiding even though they could not see him physically. So he shows up and he begins to bring evidence that uh, he is aware of the last discussion. He begins to confront um, 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 Thomas and gives him, submits himself for examination. And so Thomas now cried out. I said, my Lord and my God. That's when Thomas gave his life to Christ. That's when Thomas became born again. He was an unbeliever until Jesus came and brought physical evidence. Hi. Thomas. Well, 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 the Lord will help us. When he finished dealing with Thomas, he now said, okay, because you now see, you believe, blessed are they that believe without seeing. He was initiating the faith age. The faith age where it will not be by sight. Where it will be by, by the fact that he said so, so we believe it is so. <laughs> Bless the day that believe even though they have not seen. It means in them a living God has his strength in their hearts. And it doesn't matter what kind of torture you subject them to. If they come stumble into that believing, hey, there's nothing that can knock God out of their vessel anymore. After he said that, he stayed another peace be unto you. So the first peace was to deal with the situation of fear. The second peace was what? Was a salutation from heaven. Because it was heaven he was coming from. That was when he said, as the Father has sent me. So send I you. It was that scripture that gave us the opportunity to know how Jesus was sent from heaven. His father breathed himself into Jesus as the spirit. So when Jesus came upon the face of the earth, he lived his father. By yielding to the spirit of God, he was living out his father. So he himself now breathes himself into his disciples as the spirit. So they are supposed to live Christ. And that was why Paul says, for me to live, the definition of life for me is to live out the promptings of Christ that is furnished in my heart by the Holy Ghost. That's my daily living format. It was an appointment. So Jesus, in those days, during the time of between the, his resurrection and his ascension, he came to them by appointment. So what he was doing here in verse 49 is to give them a notice of an appointment. Can you see that? And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, which is the Holy Ghost. But go and do what? Go and establish an altar. This is appointment. You know, most of you are in the corporate world. You know what an appointment sounds like. There is a place. There is a location for the appointment. There is a venue for the appointment. And there is what? There is a time schedule for the appointment. Do you realize that in this appointment we only have the location? What is missing there? <laughs> There's no time. <laughs> and what? There is also no date. So how do you keep this uh, appointment? He has told us already. Tari ye. Tari ye. So please help me tell your neighbor. Tari ye. Because there is no time. No, you are not preaching for me. Tell him, tarry ye. Because there is no time and there is no date. 
That's why you need to be covenanted. I'm going to stay here. So the name of this game, when you set up an altar, is what? Tarry ye. I just finished your service, and when I finished your service, I knew that was it. It was not so long uh, that I lost my dad. And my dad, that was the center of the civilization of, of my kindred. He was the greatest man that ever rose. Before him, no one was greater. So, so, so many things revolved around him. He was the one that brought the first secondary school to my village. So, on his, yes, he had authority in government and said, hey, take a school to my people. All right, so, so many things revolve around him. And the moment he died, everybody left us. So I knew that the only way to break through was tarry ye. <laughs> you know, <laughs> some of you have the, the phone number of the president and you can call him and say, you know, I'm hungry, you know, and all of that. It is that phone number that, will, that is a shadow that is blocking your destiny from shining. If you want to start the journey, delete it first. Yes, let your options not be many. If not, Satan will tempt you and you, you, you will... Oh, oh, you are not aware. <laughs> you are not. So God wanted to help me. The way he helped me was that he removed every support system from my life. And I was tossed into the wilderness. Then I found out that the only hope I had was tarry. Because it, what God does to a man that he wants to bless is that he begins to give him direction. And if God is not behind what you are doing, it will not be able to conquer the demons that will come to test it. I stayed there. Began to pray. I prayed and fasted for one year for direction. The whole youth service year. I was doing four to six hours during the weekday and we used to do eight hours on saturday from eight o'clock to four p.m in tongues that god must speak i did that from january i did it to december and god did not speak please help me tell your neighbor um hearing god is hard tell, tell you. Mm. very soon i can wear the gift the gift of the spirit the gift of word of knowledge that one is easy because I am, the gift is not ministering to me. Oh, you are not, you are not. You think because I can hear and say, okay, there's somebody like, that's a gift. That's ministering from the pool of the gift of a spirit. But if you are going to hear God for yourself, you are going to hear him from the infrastructure of the unction that you have received from the Holy One. That's a different source. To stare that one is hard. You are not, you are not helping. You know why I'm telling you the truth? So that when you get ready, you really get ready. Most of you are not ready. Most of you come, you touch, you touch the altar like this and say, I do. I do. I do. <laughs> because Satan, sometimes Satan, oh, you don't know his tricks. Sometimes he will come and create the illusion that you are lonely. All he's trying to do is to get you off that place. You create the illusion that you are lonely. If you don't know that illusion, you will think it's real. Sometimes it will create the illusion in your soul that you are lost. How long? Sometimes it will create, those are the techniques we call mind-bending techniques to dissuade you away from what? The appointment. Because what you will need to arrive there is what? Tari. If you are not resolute if you don't have a vow you will have no need no reason to continue even in ministry when you are closest to a breakthrough those demons will be allowed to come test your mind i know how their voice sound now and whenever they come i say ah so i'm close i i, I talk to them i talk to them now i talk to them oh you, oh, you be, <laughs> now i know that yes Yes, now I've seen it in various seasons that I can tell you how it feels. When mind-bending demons come to manipulate you and all they are trying to do is to make you frustrated to a point where you will no longer keep the appointment. And the power to transform your life is captured in the appointment that God has given you. 
Please help me tell your neighbor, tarry. Prayed for one year with fasting. He did not speak. He spoke on other matters. Spoke about my friends. Spoke about other people. I took prophecies to people when me, I had no prophecy. Then after we finished Christmas, we did the new year. On the 13th of January, I resumed my fasting. Then I had finished youth service. We prayed for like two hours at home. Went to church. We did another two hours. And I told my friend, I don't feel I am satisfied though. He said, the same thing. We went to his house and we did two hours. After two hours, they took our power. So he went to change the face to the line where there was power. As he went into the garage to change the face, an angel walked through the wall. And I'm not saying in a vision. Right? So we have what we call a vision. That's when you see into the realm of the spirit. I'm likely to see into the realm of the spirit when we begin to pray. Every intercessor that is fully activated has that power, whether you are a prophet or not. In fact, you become, a, you become prophetic in a certain measure when you do what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about a revelation. A revelation, and what I mean is something from the spirit realm comes into your own realm. And the angel delivered the message two seconds before the guy came back from the garage. And when the guy came back from the garage, I said, my own prayer has ended. God, <laughs> God has spoken to me. God has spoken to me. It was 10 years later that I discovered that my friend did not hear God, but he stopped praying. So my telling him that God spoke to me distracted him. And as I left, he, he also left. Do not leave. Do not leave. Your redemption is tied to the altar. So that was the first appointment I kept with God. It was on the 13th of January 2003. That angel came. Prior to that time, I used to hear God from scripture. Some scriptures would pop up. But what I needed was direction. And direction as to where I would be going is not in the Bible. Just like Kuhumasi is not in the Bible. So I needed direction. I needed the Holy Ghost to speak to me. That was not a scripture thing. It was going to be a spirit-based thing. It took me 365 plus one day. That's 366 days of prayer to secure that direction. Arise. Go back to the city of Kano. And the time that God was saying I should go back to the city of Kano, Kano was a religious riot-prone city. There were agitations. The altars were crying out for blood. It was a terrible place to be. And that was when God said, go to Kano. Go to Kano. Because he sent me there, he protected me. I remember, what, oh, no need to tell you stories. No need to tell you stories. But you see, the moment you set up the altar, God, God now takes his calendar. And he marks an appointment date with you. That only him knows. Then he will wait to see if you are foolish enough to keep that appointment with him. I pray that when you leave this conference, you will go back home. And in the four bedrooms in your house, you will consecrate one room and say, you know what? Satan, if I'm going to die, I will die here. Your commitment must become a covenant because if it's just a decision, Satan knows how to make you to violate it. That's why New Year resolutions don't translate to New Year transformations. Satan will always defeat you. Somebody say, I will not smoke again. And he, he came with this. He, he, he actually meant it. And for 14 days, he did not smoke. And he was already celebrating his victory when his neighbor's son from the U.S. came back, a chain smoker. He brought road masks, he brought all kinds of them, benzin, benzin and hedges. When he flows, so the room was a chimney, and, and the demons guided the smoke into... Oh! 
This guy had smoked so much that he knows the difference between the smell of root mass and benzene. So when he came, he came out of his room to, to know who was doing this thing, the guy from America with his cap like, like, like this offered him packs. And that was how he made up of, for the 14 days of absence. <laughs> Satan has ways of making you a liar. So you will need to take it up as a covenant. I will, it, the only thing that will take me from here is that I die. Because it's an appointment. You will need to tarry long enough in order for you to collide with God. If you have kept one appointment with God, you will know what, it, what I'm talking about. It will no longer be theory to you. You will know where the power resides. You will know where the power resides. So, that's how I got back. And when I got back, because he said I should go back to Kano, so I now remember that the place where I did my youth service I was a classroom teacher. I used to teach further maths. I used to teach mathematics. I used no further maths, chemistry, and physics. Chemistry and physics and further maths. So the people said they wanted to retain me. So the only way I could prove to my family that there was something objective that I was going to do in Kano was that I told them I have, I have a job. They said, You have a job? I said, yeah, I have a job. So okay. I moved. I became a teacher. And I was putting in five, six hours a day. Putting in five, six hours a day. Putting in five, six hours. And I did that for 264 days. Yes, that's why I say it's an appointment. On, on the, no, wait. I put in eight months first. When I put in eight months, then God now spoke to me and said, I'm aware you are praying. I got angry and said, what are you talking about? I have been here tearing, crying, and you just show up. You know why I was not taught? He knew that the way I was going, I was becoming weary, and my appointment date was still in the, in the distant future. So he came and said, I'm aware. You are praying. Don't think that my silence means I'm not aware. I am aware. But you know what? The time of appointment has not yet come. So put more fuel in your vehicle and continue your journey. So I continued, it came to 264 days. Then I saw four angels in my room. Let me go to number two. So when you stay on the altar and you fulfill the latitude of the appointment, then number two is going to open up. I will stop at number two. The supervising spirit of your altar will appear. Give me Genesis chapter 31 verse 13. The entire game changes the moment the supervising spirit of your altar appears. In Genesis chapter 31 verse 13, God says, I am the God of Bethel. For those of you in the Bible study yesterday, I think you can relate with this scripture. I am the God of better, where thou anointest the pillar, and, and where thou vowest the vow unto me. That's the God of his altar. The first thing that happened when the God of his altar appeared, he did not come to him as a friend. He did not come to him as a colleague. He came to him as a king. He said, get thee out from this land and return to the land of thy kindred. He revealed to him that he was in the wrong place. He was displaced. With your best intentions, in your best intentions, with the knowledge you have as an engineer from the University of Ghana, if you try to navigate the course of your destiny, you are going to stray away from alignment. The moment the supervising spirit of his altar came up, he revealed to him that he, he was displaced. There was no way he could fulfill his destiny where he was. And do you still remember the arrow that I taught you yesterday? He realigned him. Many people will live and die in the wrong place because they never encounter the supervising spirit of their altar. They'll be playing church. And they'll be explaining the things that they should be experiencing. 
Arise! Get him back. He comes as a king. He doesn't come as your God. When your work with God starts, when the supervising spirit of your altar comes to attend to your altar, the purpose for which you set up that altar has started happening. Oh, it has started happening. That's when direction will begin to come. That's when he will give you the wisdom on how to survive the current recession that has bedeviled many nations. Where to invest. Prosperity is the simplest thing if you can hear God. I will, I will tell you a thousand times. When Abraham entered into covenant, what was lacking in his wife was that his barren wife had entered menopause. It was the supervising spirit of his altar that came to give the barren womb of his wife life and also to revive his body that was dead. That was the supernatural manifestation of the presence of the strong. That's the El Shaddai. The multi-breasted. The one that sustains all but is sustained by none. It licked up barrenness. And the woman that was past the age became fruitful again. Because with him, time is not a factor. Destiny is not, it's not time based, it's encounter based. Stop looking at the clock, old woman, and say, I, I'm 36, I'm a biological clock. It, destiny is not about time, it is about encounter. So the woman was barren, he gave him a child, gave her a child. In the case of Jacob, Jacob was broke. He ran away from home for his life. He didn't remember to go with some of his cattle. It was an emergency. The guy even came and negotiated with God, can you give me clothes to wear and make food available for me to eat? You see, his prayer was the prayer of a poor man. The type they pray in, in Africa. That was the kind of prayer he was The covenant delivered him from poverty. How did he do it? He gave him direction. The currency of prosperity is divine direction. The Bible says wisdom is profitable to direct. The profit that comes from wisdom is in his ability to give direction. You will never get any, any direction. Because the direction that will come from God is different from the way your brain works. You will need to become foolish in order for you to subscribe to that direction. And when you begin to subscribe to it, it will now prove that this is the greatest wisdom that you have ever stumbled upon. Wisdom initially looks like foolishness. Only foolish people that trust God more than their mind can walk the path of wisdom. In the third generation, in the case of Jacob, it was poverty. In the case of Isaac, it was famine. It was a recession that was widespread. Even kings were poor. That's when the supervising spirit of his altar told him, so in the land. It was a time of drought in a, in a desert. And the Bible says in the same year, he reaped an hundredfold and the Philistines, they envied him. Are you still there? So, when the supervising spirit of your altar comes, that's when your work with God begins. <laughs> oh. oh, my God. Oh, my God. That spirit, eh? the way you used to talk to your husband, you just talk with him like that one night, and the spirit will just be grieved. And the moment he's grieved, you are in trouble because you are vulnerable. Witches can see you that time. You have lost your covering. You have lost your alignment. If you are wise, you will go and appease him. The moment this, make sure you find ways to keep your supervising spirit. Make sure. Oh, Jesus Christ. There was a time I was, I was preaching. And some of the secrets God revealed to me, he didn't give me permission to begin to share it. I was much younger then. Then I began to talk about those things. And he was grieved. It took me one month, one calendar month to come back into alignment with God. Meanwhile, demons will be telling you, ah, 
take a scripture and quote it to God. That if we confess our sins, it's faithful and just to forgive us. You know what? If you go that way, it means you have forgotten that God is a person. What you are doing is that you are operating by textbook. It's flat. There's no life in it. Stay there until he comes to restore your communion. You see, some of us live from him. Eh? So we cannot afford to follow textbook methods. We follow communion methods. We follow lifelines. I, I was on the floor for how many days begging. Then I knew that if his rot is kindled, hi, it is difficult for you to amend the relationship. So you will not want to break his heart. You will not want to do it. There will be opportunities for you to sin. There will be, in fact, they will be looking for you. Every, when you start doing business with your supervising spirit, sin will, will look for you. Oh, you used to look for sin before and you didn't find any in Kuma, in Kuma. Sin will just come and say, I, I do. <laughs> because Satan will begin to trade in trying to break the alignment that you have found in your supervising spirit. And the moment you break league with him, your covering is taken away. I know how vulnerable I feel when I'm not in alignment with him. But a thousand troops cannot bring me down if I came from his presence. Oh, my God, 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 God. One of those days where we were in, in a meeting. So I don't know what happened to the crowd. They believe that if they touch my garment, something will happen to them. Me, I didn't believe it, but they believed it. And the way they were coming, I knew that I was not safe. So I had to depend on him. He showed me a strategy. He said, raise your right hand. So I raised. He knocked off. He knocked off all those people. I, I walked over them to escape. Yeah. yeah. I, I escaped over them. He knocked everybody. He will. He's my life. So I will not trade him for the games that Satan is making available. You will travel. Don't, don't start traveling ministry quickly. Make sure your feet is established. Because you will meet strange things that are not in Ghana. Mm. Things that you don't know here. They are in other places. If you are not ready for it, if you are not rooted in your altar deeply enough, you will go to some places you will easily compromise. But if you, have, if you know the texture of your supervising spirit, then your salvation has come. Because you will not want to break league with him. He's the one that will tell you when to stand. When to sit, when to walk away, and when to run. He said, Go back to the land of thy kindred. He comes with instructions. And the moment you break covenant with him, you need to be very skillful in the ways of appeasement. He's sensitive, more sensitive like a snail in his cocoon. Oh my God. I'm going to stop here. Because I need to call him now. I need to call him. I need to call him. I need to call him. I went to Tanzania. There was a beach, a very powerful beach at the foot of the Indian Ocean. And I was just speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues. I didn't know he was drawing me away. I was speaking in tongues. I was just walking on the beach. It was an endless beach. I was just speaking in tongues and I was going. I was speaking in tongues and then before I knew it, he stood by my side. So when I knew he came, I said, the last time I went to Europe, I saw children that were autistic and I was totally helpless in the face of those children. I even saw a parent that had three sons and three of them were autistic. And I saw the way she was struggling. The children could not sit down. One would just, I said, Lord, can you give me power over autism? Can you give me the authority to raise the dead? That was what I told him. Then he, he spoke to me. He said, you know that pastor? I said, I know. Go and give him this amount. So I went. 
after the prayer. And then, and then he just left. That was when I discovered I had strayed away from my hotel. I was somewhere else. That's how you get lost when you know how to travel and to navigate in pathways of the Spirit. No son of Abraham will remain at home. Just like he called Abraham and said, Get thee out of thy country. Get thee out of thy kindred. Get thee from thy father's house and go to a land that I will show you. That land had no map. The place, there was no sat nav, there was no, uh, what do you call it, ways or, or Google map. No aid for travel. He said, I will show you. It means every dream he was going to have was important. Every intuition that came to him, every scripture that came upon his spirit was part of the map. And he could not quarrel with God because he knew that it was only God that knew the map. That's how you will become if you meet the supervising spirit of your altar. You can't quarrel with him. Because you know he's the only one that knows the business. Are you still here? You can't quarrel with him. We're going to spend a moment of time. I have a few minutes. But our practical sessions will begin from tomorrow. When I teach for a little time, I will stop. And let us practice what I'm teaching. Then you will know that the strongest man among us is the one that is more intimate with the Holy Ghost. Not the brightest, not the most intelligent, not the most beautiful. And the only way you can maintain your intimacy with the Holy Ghost is a technology called the altar. The altar. I've gone indoors before, closed the door, locked myself in for three days. He didn't come. After three days, I had to go to work. So I said, may your name be praised. I know that uh, you are king and uh, you only show up when you want to show up. Uh, I will come again. Thank you for the moment. <laughs> That's how I end sessions when he doesn't show up. I hail him. Then I, I, I said, okay, I, I, will, I will return. I will come. I will come back. And as I was traveling back to my base, he came into the car. And he said, which day? When is your passport going to expire? I was wondering why I was asking that question. But I answered him. On the 20th of September, 2020, he said, your job expires that day. Then he left. I was two weeks away from becoming a manager. Two weeks away. But the supervising spirit of my altar says it's time to go. I submitted my resignation on the 5th of October 2020. A few days later. The anointing that I'm using to preach to you today was the result of that of obedience. Please help me tell your neighbor, Tari. Can you rise on your feet in a moment? I would like us to pray. The prayer point is simple. Give me the grace, the stamina to insist beyond the pressure, beyond the circumstances, beyond the situation, the, the, the stamina to insist that I will not let you go until you bless me. That kind of doggedness is the only thing that will see you through to that place where your heart can make contact with him that is invincible. Can you say a prayer to the Lord? Give me the doggedness. I will not let you go until you bless me. Somebody talks to him. Many times you have absconded from your altar. You made resolutions. You made up your mind, I'm going to travel now. Demons came and through the mind-bending craft of the kingdom of darkness, you were beguiled again and again and yet again. But tonight you want to say, Lord, I enlist. 
and I will not let you go I will not let you go until you bless me can somebody enlist 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 Satan will kindle all kinds of distractions in the realm just to get you to stray but I will not let you go I will not let you go until you bless me I will not let you go I'll be standing I'll be standing behind the altar I'll be standing in times of sickness in times of lack in times of pain in times of heartbreak I will be standing friends there is an appointment that you must catch up with his majesty is coming his majesty is coming yeah. Yeah. I will not let you go I have no other alternative I have no other choice Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. I will not let you go. I will not let you go. I journey with your spirit. I journey with your voice. Make me wise by the Holy Ghost. You have an appointment to keep. He said, Tarry ye until the supervising spirit of your altar shows up. He comes to take the place of king in your space. He will not be coming as a colleague. He will determine who you will marry, who you will do business with, what employment you will take. He orders every step and your journey with him begins when you keep the appointment. I came to tell you that he is coming. He is coming. Jesus says, when the son of man shall come shall he find faith in the earth will he still find people faithful calling upon him waiting for him will you be waiting will you be waiting will you dash the appointment will you destroy the opportunity i will not let you go make a commitment to him until you bless me i will not let you go until you break out of my life the silence has been long the silence has been long but I will wait I have no other hope rooted in no other place my only hope is in your appearance appear to me but I will not let you go the storms may come the tempter may come Satan may come the prince of this world may come he may try to bend my mind to say time is running out on me to say I'm good for nothing to say no one appreciates me 
I pray that you will develop tough skin and you will not believe in the lies of the devil but I will not let you go until you bless me until you change my story until you give me direction somebody make a commitment right now when you give your life to Christ there was some vitality in your relationship with God but now it's dry you are weak you are blind confusion has set in it is because you have no altar the vitality of the reality of God in your space will be made efficacious by a living altar I will not let you go until you bless me this time I will stay this time I will not be a victim this time I will not be distracted this time I will not walk away this time I must see your glory this time I must see your faith the steward of the altar must understand that apart from God he has no hope men were designed to live around their altars Abraham pitched tents and he built his altar the altar was permanent the tent was temporary today we build tents we pitch our altars our altars are temporary our estate in the earth our roots in the earth are permanent I will not let you go until you bless me until you guide me until you open my heart to understand until I know when to make a move when to take a step when to jump when to hide when to show myself until I understand my days in the wilderness and the season of my manifestation I will not let you go until I learn the dialect you have been trying to teach me all these years that the flesh profited nothing oh but it is the spirit that quickens I will not let you go when you find him make him king when you find him never let him go when you find him trap him down when you find him hold on forever when you find him when you find him suddenly the authority of the witches in the neighborhood can be undermined suddenly the deaths in the family will cease suddenly the yoke of retrogression backwardness the spell will be broken I will not let you go until you bless me for my destiny is tied to you and without you I can do nothing arise oh God stand upon my altar upon my altar amen i yes and i come by my mother semine sana bongo malai 
Hallelujah. 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 Kelino Motesi. Raike Moskino Mokoloto Moyo. Thank you, Lord. Give me Amos chapter 9, verse 1 on the screen. Amos chapter 9, verse 1. And I saw the Lord standing upon the altar. That's the day the supervising spirit of your altar comes. You'll be standing. The foundation upon which you'll be standing is your altar. And he comes as the Lord, as Adonai. He comes as king, as master. He doesn't come to suggest, he comes to command. Oh my God. Can you cry to him as a stand on my altar? Let your voice never become whispers in my heart. Let it be the voice of a king. Utterances of, judge, of justice, of judgment and of equity. Stand upon my altar. <laughs> 